So uh, I just use this uh, and, and, uh, to emphasize the point that we are the first graduate entry uh, program in Malaysia. Um, in fact, we're the, probably we're the, there's one other graduate entry program that I'm aware of in Southeast Asia, that down in, in uh, the Duke Singapore program, which has some very important differences from ours um, that we can talk about if you'd like to, but is also uh, kind of is the first graduate entry program in Malaysia. Um, why Johns Hopkins? Um, for those of you who don't know, Johns Hopkins is arguably the most famous medical institution in the United States right now. Um, it's, uh, this is the U.S. News and World, World Report honor roll, which ranks uh, U.S. hospitals every year, and just came out again last week. Uh, this is actually 2010 through 11, and I just didn't have time to make the 11 12 slide yet. Um, but the 11 12 is, is uh, actually interesting because uh, the 21st year in a row, 21 years straight, Johns Hopkins Hospital is the top hospital in the United States. And some of you, if you've heard of, I'm sure you've heard of some of these other hospitals. Interesting that in, from uh, 2010 to 11, 2011 12, Mass General jumped up from third to second. So for about the past 20 years, Mayo Clinic has been number two. Um, and this is the first year Mass General overtook them and went ahead Mayo Clinic. So I'm sure Mayo Clinic is all depressed and demoralized. Uh, but Hopkins is still happy. We're number one. That's the hospital. What about the university um, and the medical part of the university? Uh, these on the, on the left are, the uh, again, U.S. News World Report rankings of U.S. Departments of Medicine. So this is specifically the academic side of medicine. And you'll see here that Hopkins is tied and perennially tied with Harvard as number one. So for, on the hospital side, we're number one always. On the academic side, we're tied for number one always with Harvard, which is not such. Um, on the right are university life sciences ratings from the QS ratings. These are international rankings. And there's a lot of take home messages here. You'll see that Johns Hopkins which actually is substantially smaller than everybody above that. We're, we're actually a pretty small university by U.S. standards. Um, total number of students at Johns Hopkins, uh, less than 15,000. Um, these other schools have up in the range 20 to 40,000 students. So we're small, but we're number eight in the world on these rankings. But the other important thing is that there's not, you have to go into the second 20, or somewhere between 20 and 40 to see anybody from, um, uh, Asia, from Southeast Asia. The highest rank in Southeast Asia is uh, in U.S. And there's nobody in the top 200 from Malaysia. Nobody, not one. Um, University of Malaya, if you go back five years ago, was ranked, but they've dropped out of the rankings the past uh, couple years. And, and we can talk about why that is, but I think that's an important thing. And that's where Perdana University uh, plans to make impact in Malaysia. And that's one of the reasons why we're not a branch campus at Johns Hopkins. We are a distinctive Malaysian university that has the goal of kind of making a distinctive mark on Malaysia. <coughs> well, if you go through, why are the U.S. medical schools so highly ranked? So if you go back and look at those premier rankings, of the top 20, I think 16 of the top 20 are, are U.S. schools. Why is that? What is it about the U.S. schools, why they readily are the ranked the highest? Well, a lot of it has to do with research. A lot of it has to do with research, because that's how you get an international reputation, is through research, it's through your publications, it's through your citations, it's through your national, international awards, et cetera, et cetera. And it's also by your students who leave your university and go be faculty at other universities worldwide. Because some of what these rankings look at is reputation. And the way you develop a reputation is by having your graduates go be faculty elsewhere, be successful elsewhere, and that garners respect of other institutions. That's a huge re uh, reason why. And I think this is another way, another opportunity for Perdana, Hugsom specifically, to make an impact because we are going to have a substantial research focus from day one, which again, I'm also very, very happy to talk about, um, and is also part of our undergraduate, our medical curriculum also. The other thing that distinguishes the U.S. medical schools, I think, from many of the Asian and British um, and the European medical schools is they're all founded on what we call, and all the big ones, Harvard, us, Stanford, are founded on what's called the tripartite mission. And that's the, the triangular mission of patient care, um, research, and education, with the notion that each one of those is equal, such that the figure for many of our institutions is an equilateral triangle with one of those missions at, the point, at all three points. And it is felt very strongly and very passionately, and that's what I feel, that you can't have one mission without the other. So you can't be only patient care, 
research helps patient care, research helps education, education helps patient care, helps research, clinical care helps research and education. They're integrally intertwined. And you, if you're going to found a medical institution, you've got to found it on all three principles from day one. You can't just create a clinical place and say, oh, we'll do a little bit of research also. That's a key point, and that's where PugSum is going to be different than any place else in Malaysia, as far as I know. Um, grad, so that's essentially, you know, kind of PugSum, the, the kind of the, the um, why Hopkins is here in some respects, and, and kind of probably not having to advertise, but to tell you why Hopkins is so preeminent. And I think the take home point is that all of these lessons that have made Hopkins great are the things that we actually are planning to start from PubStop from day one. And we're going to do it in Malaysia, and we're going to do it with Malaysians. So we're going to take the principles, we're going to take the values, we're going to take the ethos, we're going to take the integrity, we're going to take the ambition of Johns Hopkins and try to establish that, uh, plant the, uh, the groundwork here in Malaysia. Why graduate medical entry and why is Hopkins so famous? This is a little bit of a history lesson. Why is Hopkins the most famous graduate medical entry uh, um, medical school, certainly in the United States, arguably in the world, but certainly in the United States, unequivocally in the United States? It's because of these two women, uh, Mary Elizabeth Garrett and M. Carrie Thomas. Interesting pairing of women. Turns out that they were they both lived in the late 1800s. They kind of reached their adulthood in the late 1800s in Baltimore. Turns out they were neighbors. They lived right across the street from each other. Their fathers were very, very dear friends. Their fathers were both wealthy industrialists in the late 1800s in Baltimore. It turns out that Mary Elizabeth Garrett's father um, was on the original board of trustees of Johns Hopkins University, was one of Johns Hopkins' closest friends. And when Johns Hopkins passed away, he, uh, Mary Elizabeth Garrett's father was one of the uh, founding board of trustees of Johns Hopkins University that was founded with uh, Johns Hopkins' bequest, his death bequest. She became the wealthiest. When her father passed away, she was unmarried, it turns out. And one of the reasons she never married is because she never wanted a man to control her money. Uh, and the kind of the, the rules of the day back then was that if you got married, the man got all your money. She was very wealthy, um, and she wanted to control her own money. And she became the wealthiest female philanthropist in the United States in the late 1800s. Was very active in a number of causes. Uh, was instrumental in getting women to vote in the United States, it turns out. But she also was clearly instrumental in the founding of Johns Hopkins School of Medicine. Johns Hopkins, when he passed away, gave enough money to start a hospital and a university, both of which were started. The hospital in 1889, the university in 1885, but they ran out of money to open the medical school. They ran out of money because of a depression around that time. Mary Elizabeth Garrett had enough money to found the medical school, but she essentially extorted the board of trustees of Johns Hopkins University and said, if you want a medical school, you'll do it on my conditions. And I'll show you the conditions on the next slide. And the conditions she came up with were based on the fact that her best friend, M. Carrie Thomas, was the leading female educator of the time in the United States. She was the president of the leading female college in the United States and was probably was the first woman in the United States, uh, first academic woman to have a PhD, which she had to go to Europe to get, by the way. Um, and she kind of convinced Mary, uh, 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 Mary Elizabeth Garrett to say, OK, Hopkins wants your money. Here's what you need to tell Hopkins to do. So here's what they did. They would not allow Hopkins to open as a medical school unless they opened from day one as a co-educational institution that admitted women on equal basis from men. First medical school in the United States to do that, arguably first medical school in the world because even the European ones kind of were separate at that time. This is revolutionary. They required a baccalaureate degree to get into the Hopkins Medical School. Prior to that, you could start medical school straight out of high school, equivalent here, A-levels. You could start medical school anytime you wanted to. There was no prerequisites to start med school. They said, these two women said, you want to start med school, you have to get an undergraduate first degree. It should be in science. You have to have a broad education. You have to know three languages. You have to know they expected people to be educated before they were physicians and then use physician training as the ground, as the launching pad for the rest of their life. That was revolutionary. That, was, that had never been done in the United States. They created a four-year curriculum. Uh, they and their colleagues that created the four-year curriculum that still stands in the United States as the standard for medical school in the United States. They integrated basic sciences with the clinical teaching. They were the first combined hospital and medical school. Prior to that, and it's true here in this country, you can open up a medical school and not have your own hospital. Now, the government universities all have their own hospitals, but the, most of the private universities do not have a hospital. 
In the United States, Hopkins was the first place to say medical school and hospital should be conjoined together with a combined governance. And with Hopkins was the first place to do that. And that's been the model for the rest of the United States. And they also hired full-time faculty, not just bringing in doctors to teach part-time, but full-time faculty who belong to the school and belong to the hospital. And again, this is from day one. This is revolutionary thinking. This is 1880s, OK? Malaysia is not even founded as, a, as, a, as an independent country for another almost uh, 80 years. Um, and our country, the United States, is only 100 years old at this time. This is revolutionary. And what's amazing is these are still the model by which we still, uh, most medical schools in the United States are governed. The, the, what solidified Hopkins as the model was in 1910, the government, actually the Carnegie Foundation commissioned a report to say, medical school education in the United States is in chaos. You have all these commercial medical schools that are for profit and are not affiliated with hospitals. You have some state schools that are good, but some of them allow women, some of them don't allow women, et cetera, et cetera. So they, the Carnegie Foundation said, ask this man, Abraham Flexner, go out and survey every single medical school in the country and decide what's good, what's bad, what we should do with the future of medical school. And he wrote a report in 1910 called the Flexner Report that said the ideal, the standard should be what Johns Hopkins is doing, and all medical schools should be patterned on Johns Hopkins. And within, within 20 years, 50% of the medical schools in the United States closed down. Those commercial, purely for-profit medical schools shut down, 50% of them. And the model of Hopkins became the model for the rest of the United States. After that, strict regulation and kind of uh, quality uh, standards for medical school were imposed, et cetera, et cetera. But it was all based on Hopkins as the model. 